Hello, dear students. Uh, I'm Dr. Mazhar Ali, and I welcome you back uh, to the course Introduction to Artificial Intelligence. Last time we uh, took a look at machine learning, a set of techniques that computer can use to take a set of data and learn some patterns inside of that data and learn how to perform a task, even if we, uh, the programmers didn't give the computer explicit uh, instructions for how to perform that task. So today we transition to one of the most popular technique and tools within machine learning that have neural networks. So neural networks were inspired as early as the 1940s by researchers uh, you know, who were thinking about how it is that humans learn extending neuroscience and the human brain and trying to see whether or not we can apply those same ideas to computers as well and model computer learning off of human learning. So how is um, uh, the brain structured? Uh, very simple if you look here, very simply the brain consisted of a, a whole bunch of neurons like this. And um, those neurons are connected and communicate um, uh, with, uh, an, each, uh, with each and each other. Um, in some way, uh, in particular, if you uh, think about the structure of the biological neural network, uh, something like uh, this, like here, uh, there are a couple of uh, key properties that scientists observed. So one was uh, uh, one was that uh, these neurons are connected to each other and uh, receive electrical signals from one another. So that one neuron can propagate electrical signals to another neuron and another point is that neurons uh, uh, process those input signals and then uh, can be activated that a neuron becomes activated at a certain point and then can propagate further signals onto neuron in the future. And uh, so the question then become, could we take the, this biological idea of how it is that humans learn? Uh, with brain and with neurons and apply that to a machine as well. So in effect, uh, designing an artificial neural network or ANN. And what artificial neural networks will allow us to do is they will uh, first be able to model some sort of mathematical function. So every time you look at um, a neural network, which uh, we will see more uh, of later today, uh, each one of them is a really just some mathematical function that is mapping certain inputs to particular outputs based on the structure of the network that depending on uh, where we uh, place particular units inside of this neural network that is um, going to determine how it is that the network is going to function. And in particular, artificial neural networks are uh, going to lend themselves to a way that uh, we can learn what the new uh, network's uh, parameters should be. So, uh, in order to create an artificial uh, neural network instead of uh, using biological neurons, we are just going to use what we are going to call units uh, like this. So, units inside of the of a, uh, inside our neural network, um, which we can re represent kind of uh, like this node, if you look here um, in the graph. So, which will here be uh, represented just by a, a blue circle, uh, like uh, this one, so in blue circle. And, and these artificial units, uh, these are artificial neurons can be connected to one another. So, uh, if you look here, uh, for instance, so we have two units, so one is this and second one is uh, this, and that are connected with the, each other to, by uh, this arrow, um, or the by, we may call it uh, uh, edge. So these two units are connected by this edge inside uh, very effectively. And <clears throat> even the, if you look here, uh, the, these two circles, which we show here, the artificial neurons, are connected by this edge. And so uh, what we are going to do now is think of this idea as some sort of uh, uh, mapping from inputs to output. It means if we are inputting here, so that input will be, uh, and this circle will be the output of this input. So that we have uh, one unit that is connected to another uh, unit um, that we might think of uh, this side as, as the input, as I told you, this side is as an input and uh, this side is a output. 
Uh, and what um, we are trying to do then uh, is to figure out uh, how to solve the problem. So um, how to model uh, some sort of mathematical function. And this might uh, take the uh, form of something we saw last time in the lecture, machine, lecture of machine learning. So which was something like um, we have certain inputs like variable x1 uh, like this and uh, x2. And, uh, and um, given those inputs, we want uh, to perform some sort of task a task like predicting whether uh, whether or not it's going to rain. It means, for example, this cloud is uh, raining, and if we uh, delete these drops, then it will show not raining. So uh, X1 and X2 were showing like that. X1 uh, is uh, raining, and X2 was uh, not raining. And ideally, uh, we would write some way, given these inputs, X1 and X2, uh, X1 and X2, uh, which is trained for some sort of um, variables uh, to do uh, with the weather like this. And we, we would like to be able to predict in um, this case a Boolean classification. Is it going to rain or is it not going to rain? And we did this last time by way of mathematical function. So <clears throat> we defined some function uh, H uh, for a hypothesis function uh, that took uh, uh, as an input x1 and x2, the two inputs uh, that we cared about processing. So in order to determine uh, whether we thought it was uh, going to rain or um, whether we uh, thought it was not going to rain. So uh, the question then becomes, uh, what does this hypothesis function do in order to make that determination? And we decided last time uh, to use a linear combination of these input variables to determine what the output should be. So if you remember the last lecture, which um, I delivered on the machine learning, uh, we discussed uh, this type of the uh, equation. So, <clears throat> so a hypothesis function, this one, uh, was equal to something like uh, this weight. So uh, weight zero uh, plus weight one and uh, uh, plus uh, weight two. And uh, so now what's going on here is that X one and X two. So those are input variables if you those are in, uh, the inputs to this hypothesis function. And each of uh, those inputs is uh, being multiplied by some weight, which is just some number. So like here, if you look here, weight one is a multiplied by X1 and weight two is a multiplied by uh, X2. And so we have had <coughs> same is uh, here, no? like, uh, the previous lecture and uh, we have this uh, additional weight uh, like uh, if you look here this is the additional uh, weight so that doesn't get uh, uh, multiplied by an input uh, uh, variable at all so that just serves to either move uh, the function up or move the functions uh, value down so uh, you can think of uh, this is a uh, w0 you may think of this uh, either a weight uh, that's just multiplied by some dummy value like the number one when it's a multiplied by one and so it's not multiplied by anything or sometimes you will see in uh, the literature uh, people call it, uh, this variable with zero a bias in the machine learning or in the deep learning and this type of the variable is mostly called a uh, bias uh, so that you can think of uh, these variables as uh, slightly different so we have weights that are uh, multiplied by the input uh, means uh, x1 and x2 and uh, we separate separately uh, add some bias to the result as well <clears throat> so you will hear both of uh, those terminology used when people uh, talk about neural networks and machine learning so in effect uh, uh, what we have done here is that in order to define a hypothesis here this you look here um, hypothesis function we just uh, need to decide and figure out uh, what these weights, uh, W0, W1, W2, uh, especially the W1 and uh, W2, uh, 
what these weights should be uh, to determine what values to multiply by our uh, inputs to get some sort of uh, result. So of course, uh, at the end of this, what we need to do is um, uh, make some sort of classification like raining or not raining and to do that, uh, we use some sort of function to define some sort of, of a threshold. So, oh, fine, this is. And so we saw, uh, for instance, the step function, uh, this, this one, step function, uh, which is defined as uh, one if the result of multiplying the weights by the inputs is uh, at least zero. And this is a one and if the result is at zero, otherwise it's zero. So you can think of uh, this line, uh, <coughs> this line down the middle, you know, like this one. So it's kind of uh, like a dotted line. You, you look here. Uh, so effectively, uh, it says that uh, zero all the way up to one point, uh, like this one, uh, zero. And then the function steps or jumps up to uh, one, up, uh, jumps up to uh, one. So it's a zero before it uh, reaches some threshold and then uh, it's a one uh, after it reaches a, a particular threshold. And so this was one way uh, we could define what we will come to call an activation function. So a fun activation function is a function that determines when it is that this output becomes active. So changes to one instead of being zero. So but we also saw that if we uh, didn't just want um, uh, purely binary classification, if we didn't want purely one or zero, but we wanted to allow for some in between real number values, we could use a different function. And um, there are a number of um, choices, um, but the one that we uh, looked at was the logistic sigmoid. Uh, uh, sigmoid, sigmoid is a function uh, that has sort of um, an S-shaped curve. Like if you look here, this is the S-shaped curve, uh, where we could uh, represent this as a probability uh, that may be somewhere in between the probability of a rain of something like uh, 0 0.5, if you, this will be the 0 0.5, uh, and uh, maybe a little bit later, the probability of a rain is a 0 0.8 even. Uh, and so rather than just have a binary classification of zero or one, so we can um, allow numbers uh, that are in between um, as well. Uh, and it turns out uh, uh, there are many other different types uh, of uh, uh, activation function. Um, where an uh, activation function just takes the output of multiplying the weights together and adding that uh, bias and then figuring out uh, uh, that uh, uh, means the, what the actual output should be. So another popular uh, one is the uh, rectified linear uh, unit, uh, most uh, otherwise known as a ReLU. The commonly it is known as a ReLU. Uh, and the uh, way uh, that works is that uh, it just takes as an input and it takes the maximum of that input and um, zero. So, uh, look here. So, um, if it's uh, positive, it remains unchanged, but uh, if it's a negative, it goes ahead and levels out at uh, zero. And uh, there are other activation functions that uh, we can choose as well uh, for a uh, uh, deep learning program. So, it depends on you that uh, you for whom you are going, means which activation uh, uh, function are you selecting. Uh, but uh, in short, each of these activation functions, you can just think of as uh, function that gets applied to, to the result of all of uh, this computation. So we take some function uh, G <coughs> and apply it to the result of um, all of that calculation. Uh, and this, this then is uh, what we saw last time, uh, the way of defining some uh, hypothesis function that takes uh, an input classes, some uh, linear combination of those inputs and then passes it through some sort of activation function to get output. And this uh, actually turns out to be uh, the model for the simple of neural networks that where we are going to instead represent this mathematical idea graphically uh, by using a structured uh, 
like uh, this if you look here like uh, this so here then is a neural network uh, that has two inputs so one is uh, this and second one is uh, this so we can think of uh, this as a uh, this one is a x1 and this one is a uh, x2 and the, then one um, output, so which you can think of classifying whether or not we think it's going to rain or uh, no rain. For example, in the particular instance, and um, <coughs> so how exactly uh, uh, does this model work? Like the, this one is X1 and this is X2 and this one is a uh, output. So each of uh, these two inputs represent one of our input variable, uh, x1 and uh, x2. And notice that uh, these inputs are connected to this output via these edges. This is, uh, these are the edges. This is one edge uh, for x1 and it is a second edge for x2. Uh, so which are going to be uh, defined by their uh, weights. Uh, like the age one is showing W1 weight and age two is showing W2 weight, uh, weight. So these ages each have a weight associated with them. Weight one and uh, weight one and weight two. And then this output unit. So what um, it's going to do is, um, uh, is it uh, means uh, it's going to calculate output based on those inputs and based on those uh, weights. So uh, this output unit is going to multiply all the inputs by their weights. I mean, there are two weights, oh, sorry, two inputs. And in this uh, bias term, which you can think of uh, as an extra, if you look here, this is a bias term, means it's an extra, <coughs> uh, extra term. So that gets added into it. And um, then we pass it, uh, means we pass it, through an activation function uh, to <coughs> like the, <coughs> so this then is just a graphical way of representing the same idea we saw last time, uh, just mathematically. And um, we are going to call this a very simple neural network and we would like for uh, this neural network to be able to learn how to calculate some function. Uh, so that we uh, we want uh, some function for the neural network to learn and the neural network is uh, going to learn what should be the values of uh, w0 uh, and w1 and w2b so what what should the activation function be in order to get the result that we would expect and so it was the, uh, about the activation functions. Now we will discuss about the gradient descent. Um, it is an algorithm for minimizing <coughs> the loss as we discussed uh, last in the previous lecture. So now we discuss the loss with the different names and its uh, functions. So when you are training a neural network uh, and uh, recall that loss refers to have a bed of a uh, hypothesis function happens to be. So that we can define certain loss function and uh, this loss function is just a mathematical function and when you have a mathematical function in calculus, what you could do is uh, calculate um, uh, something known as the gradient. <coughs> so which you can think of um, uh, is like a slope. So it's the direction the loss function is uh, moving at uh, any particular uh, point and uh, what it's going to tell us is in, um, in which direction should we be moving these uh, weights in order to minimize the amount of loss. So uh, there may be gradient descent or stochastic uh, gradient descent or standard gradient descent, uh, mini batch gradient descent algorithms for minimizing the loss. And when you are training a neural network, we will uh, discuss in detail these are all the last functions and some other uh, lectures. Um, in this lecture, we just um, define the gradient descent and, and name the other last function because we have to save the time for the other uh, <coughs> process or uh, parts of the neural network. So now, how is it that you would go about training a neural network that has a multiple outputs instead of just one? So with just a single output, 
uh, we could see what the output for that uh, value should be and then you update all of the weights that, that correspondence to it and when we have uh, multiple outputs uh, then we can really think of this as four separate uh, neural networks so that, that really we just have uh, one uh, then we can really think of this as four separate uh, networks that really we just have um, one network here that um, has these three inputs so if you look here uh, for example if we look at the, this one this is four output but if we look here this this um, uh, output has three input means uh, uh, and same happens with this 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 and even the if means each input has four outputs and each output ha has even uh, three inputs <coughs> And, and the same thing is true for uh, even the, this output or this output and uh, this output. So this output value effectively defines yet another neural network that has uh, these some three inputs like uh, this one, but a different set of uh, weights that correspondence to this output. And likewise, uh, this output uh, has its own set of weights as uh, well, like this output has its own set of weights in form of uh, input. And the same thing uh, for fourth output two as like the for this one as well. So, but uh, it's important uh, then to think about um, what the limitation of uh, this sort of approach is uh, of just uh, taking some uh, linear combination of inputs and uh, passing uh, uh, like uh, now passing it into some sort of activation function. And it turns out uh, that when we do this in the uh, case of a binary classification, so we can only uh, predict things that are linearly separable because uh, we are taking a linear combination of inputs and using that to define uh, some decision boundary or threshold then uh, what we get is a situation where if we have uh, the set of a data set like if you look here uh, so we can uh, predict a line uh, that supports um, linearly the red uh, points from the blue points because without line we cannot uh, feel them the separate but in some uh, single uh, uh, input or output but if we uh, draw here a line like this one now uh, these both groups are separated uh, by the this line this is a red group and this is a blue group for example the red group shows it's not raining and the blue group shows it's a raining but both are uh, separated but uh, without uh, this line we cannot um, feel them the separate <coughs> separate so But a single unit uh, that is um, making a binary classification, otherwise known as a perceptron, can deal with the situation uh, like this. Means this is not linear, so perceptron could not deal uh, with like uh, this graph. No doubt, it may deal with this one, but it uh, cannot deal uh, with like uh, uh, the, this graph. So. <clears throat> Uh, like this, uh, where we have uh, seen this type of uh, situation before, uh, for example, uh, where there is a uh, no straight line that uh, just goes uh, straight through the data that will divide the red points away from the blue points because this is not the linear that we can draw a line here and separate the red from the blue, but these are the red circles are uh, here surrounded by uh, blue circles so it's a more complex decision boundary the decision boundary uh, somehow needs to capture the uh, things inside of the circle and uh, there uh, isn't really a line that will allow us to deal with that so this is the limitation of the perceptron as we discussed 
uh, already. So these units uh, that just uh, make these binary decisions based on and their inputs uh, that a single perceptron is only capable of uh, learning a linearly separable uh, decision boundary. So it can um, do is define a line and sure. So it can give us uh, probabilities based on how close to the decision boundary we are. Um, but um, it can only really decide based on a, a linear decision boundary. And so uh, this doesn't seem like uh, it's uh, going to generalize well to situation where real world data is involved because the real world data often isn't uh, linearly separable. Uh, the real world data is almost uh, often it's a mix like this one. In the real uh, world data is a night like uh, uh, this one that we may separate them linearly by drawing the line. But uh, it comes uh, mostly in, uh, in this shape. So um, it's a really difficult uh, uh, work. And so this it doesn't uh, seem like it's uh, going to generalize world to situation because this is a real world problem. And so it often isn't the case that uh, we can just draw a line like if here and we separate them, no. Uh, and uh, so we may uh, be able to divide it up into multiple groups. So what then is the solution to this uh, problem is? Uh, well, uh, what was uh, proposed uh, was the idea of um, a multi-layer neural network that so far, uh, like the here, we need a multi-layer neural network uh, so all of the neural networks uh, we have seen have had a set of inputs and a set of outputs and the inputs are connected to those outputs. But in a multi-layer neural network, uh, this is going to be an artificial neural network that has an input layer listed and um, it is an output layer, but also has um, uh, one or more uh, hidden layers in between. Um, other layers of artificial neural uh, uh, neurons or the units uh, that are going to calculate the values as well. Uh, so instead of the neural network that uh, looks like this one, uh, there are three input and one output. Uh, uh, but uh, <clears throat> you might imagine uh, in the middle uh, here, injecting the uh, hidden layer. Otherwise, in the first slide, if you look here, only there are the three inputs. Uh, these are the three inputs. And these all uh, three inputs are connected with this output through the edges. Uh, but uh, in the multi layer neural networks, if you look well, the hidden layer is uh, injected here, like this one. So this is the uh, hidden layer. <coughs> So uh, it has, uh, I mean, this uh, hidden layer has uh, four nodes. So you could choose uh, uh, how many nodes or units uh, end up going into the hidden layer and you have multiply hidden layers as well. And so now uh, each of these uh, inputs uh, isn't directly connected to output means if we look about uh, this input, this input is uh, not directly connected with the uh, it means this uh, with, uh, this output, but uh, this unit is uh, connected with this one, uh, with this one, uh, with this one. It means these four uh, uh, hidden layer uh, outputs, even these three, three inputs uh, are not directly connected uh, with the output, but with the, these uh, hidden this uh, hidden layer. So. <coughs> So each of the inputs is connected to a hidden layer. And then all of uh, the nodes in the hidden layer are connected to output. Means the input uh, layer or input uh, inputs are not connected uh, through the, uh, with the output directly, but through the hidden layer. Means hidden layer is uh, bridging here for the inputs and outputs. So uh, this is just another step that uh, we can take towards calculating more complex functions. Each of these hidden units uh, will calculate uh, its output value, otherwise known as uh, its uh, activation uh, based on a linear combination of all the inputs. 
And once we have values um, for all of uh, these nodes, uh, as proposed to uh, this just uh, being the output, and we do the uh, same thing again. So calculate the output of the of this node. If you look here, of this node, calculate its the weight for uh, based on the multiplying each of the values for these units by their weights as well. So in effect, um, um, we have this work. Uh, uh, means uh, this work is uh, that we start with the inputs. Uh, these are the inputs: input one, input two, input three. So they get multiplied by weights to calculate values for the hidden uh, inputs or hidden nodes. Sorry, hidden nodes, and um, those get multiplied by weights to figure out uh, uh, what the ultimate output is going to be. Like this means these are multi uh, inputs uh, are multiplied to uh, hidden nodes, and hidden nodes uh, multiplied weight uh, for the output. Uh, so the advantage of wearing this like this is uh, it gives us an ability to model more complex functions so each of these hidden nodes can learn a different decision boundary and we can uh, combine those decision boundaries to figure out um, what the ultimate output is going to be and so the strategy people came up uh, with was to say that if you know uh, what the error or um, uh, the loss on the output node uh, and then based on uh, what these uh, weights are. So um, if one of uh, these weights is higher than another, you can calculate and estimate for how much uh, the error from this node was due to uh, this part of the hidden node or, node, or uh, this part of the hidden layer or this part of the uh, hidden layer based on the values of these weights. So in effect saying uh, that um, based on the error from the output, uh, I can propagate uh, the error and figure out and estimate for uh, what the error is for each of uh, these hidden layer as well. So we, if uh, there are error, we will use the propagation or the propagation layer. Uh, so there are some more calculus um, uh, here that we wouldn't get into the details of but the idea of uh, this algorithm is known as a uh, back propagation so it's an algorithm for training a neural network with the multiple different hidden layers uh, like this these are the multiple hidden layers if you look here and um, means uh, this multiple layer uh, is a shown uh, shown here graphically not the mathematically uh, the way you might uh, think about this is that uh, we first start with the output. Now look, where is the output? This is the output. This one is the output. So we know what the output should be. So we know what output we calculated and based on that, um, we can figure out that how to, or how do we uh, need to update, uh, update those weights. So Big propagating the error uh, we, uh, to those nodes, and using that uh, we can figure out um, how we should update the nodes uh, or the these weights. And um, you might imagine if uh, there are uh, multiple layers, we could repeat this process again and again. Here, only single uh, hidden layer, and three input nodes and four output, oh sorry, hidden nodes or hidden layer. So this propagation algorithm is the key algorithm that makes neural networks possible and makes it possible to take these multiple level structures and be able to train those structures depending on what the values of these weights are to figure out how it is that we should go about updating those weights to create some function and that can minimize the total amount of loss to uh, figure out some uh, good setting of the weights uh, that will uh, take the inputs and translate it into the outputs we expect. So this is a complex uh, neural network, a multi-layer network. So this works as we said, uh, not just for a single hidden layer, but uh, with the two or uh, three hidden layers. So you can imagine multiple hidden layers here. You know, 
uh, where each hidden layer we just defined however many nodes we want so where each of the nodes in one layer we can connect to the nodes in the next layer and defining more and more complex networks that can model more and more complex types of the function so these are the input uh, nodes of input layer and uh, again these are connected with this hidden layer and this hidden layer is connected with this hidden layer and this one is at uh, this uh, and uh, this is the output so this may be the any the activation even the layer so even you may extend this type of the neural networks by inputting more uh, hidden layers so therefore uh, this type of means uh, this type of the uh, network is what we might, might call, call it uh, deep uh, neural network a part of a larger family of deep, deep learning algorithms uh, if you have ever heard that uh, and uh, definitely you heard a lot because we have been uh, discussing uh, these terms since the third semester and all deep learning is about uh, is it's using multiple layers to be able to predict and to be able to model higher level features inside of the input uh, to be able to figure out what the output should be and so the deep neural network is just a neural network that um, has multiple of uh, these hidden layers so where we started the input means these are the input uh, calculate values for uh, this, layer, this layer then this layer then this layer means this layer then this layer uh, and then ultimately get an output uh, this so uh, this allows us to be able to model more and more sophisticated types of functions that uh, each of these layers can I mean these layers can be calcul uh, can calculate something a little bit different and we can combine that information to figure out uh, what the output should be <clears throat> and of course uh, as with any situation of machine learning as we begin to make our model more and more complex to model more and more complex functions the risk we run is something uh, like overfitting so one of the risks we uh, run with uh, far, <clears throat> far more complex neural networks that has uh, many many different nodes is that we might overfit based on the input data so we might uh, grow over uh, uh, variant uh, on a certain nodes to calculate um, things just purely based on the input data that doesn't allow us to generalize very well to the output and uh, <clears throat> There are several strategies uh, for dealing with um, overfitting, but one of the most popular in the context of neural network is a technique known as a dropout. And what dropout uh, uh, does it? Uh, so when we are um, training the neural network, uh, what we will do in dropout is a temporarily remove units, temporarily remove these artificial neurons from our network, choosing it at random. And the goal here is to prevent over reliance uh, on uh, certain units. So what generally happens in overfitting is that we begin to over rely on certain units inside the neural networks to be able to tell us how to interpret the uh, input data. So what dropout will do is uh, randomly remove some of uh, these units to reduce the chance that we or uh, rely on certain units to make our uh, neural network more robust, uh, robust to be uh, able to handle the situation even when we just drop out particular neurons uh, entirely. So uh, the way that uh, might work is uh, we have a neural network, like if you look here, this is the neural network. And um, as we are <coughs> training it, uh, when we go about trying to update the uh, weights, uh, the first time uh, we will just randomly pick some uh, percentage of the nodes to drop out of the network. It's as if the, those nodes are, <coughs> are not there at all. So it is as if the weights associated uh, with those nodes uh, are not uh, there at all. 
if you look here. And um, we will train in this way, uh, look here. So then the next time we update uh, the weights. So we will pick different set and just go ahead and train that in a way. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, then again, randomly choose and train with the other uh, nodes uh, that have been uh, dropped that as well. And the goal of that is that after the, uh, after the training process, if you train by dropping out random uh, nodes, uh, we removed uh, the random nodes, uh, in, uh, which were here inside the neural network. So if you look here again, uh, <clears throat> you hopefully end up uh, with a network that's a little bit uh, more robust. If you look here at this neural network, so it looks uh, more robust. Uh, it uh, doesn't rely too heavily on any one particular node. You see, uh, these nodes uh, does not rely on, uh, on the single node or the particular node. Therefore, it's a robust type of the neural network. So, <clears throat> <clears throat> but more generally learns how to approximate uh, a function in general. So that then is a look at uh, some of uh, these techniques <clears throat> that uh, we can use to implement a neural network to get uh, at the idea of taking this input, like the, this one, this input, uh, passing th it through these various layers, like this layer, this layer, to produce some sort of the output, this one. <clears throat> and um, what we would like to do now is uh, uh, take uh, those ideas and put them into code and uh, to do that uh, there are a number of different machine learning libraries, neural network libraries that um, uh, we can use that allow us to get access to some one implement, uh, implementation of uh, back propagation and uh, all of uh, these hidden layers. So for the coding uh, and these models, uh, why can't provide you a platform with uh, Google's uh, TensorFlow? Uh, TensorFlow is uh, one of the most popular software developed by the Google is known as the TensorFlow, a library that we can use for quickly creating neural networks and modeling them and running them on some sample data to see uh, what the output is going to be. So it is an um, open source artificial intelligence library using uh, data flow graphs to build uh, models. So it allows uh, developers to create large scale neural networks with uh, many layers. So TensorFlow is uh, mainly used for classification, perception, understanding, discovering, prediction, and uh, uh, creation as well. So it is an open source artificial intelligence library, as I told you before, using data flow graphs to build models. It allows developers to create large scale neural networks with many layers. So TensorFlow is mainly used, uh, as I told you, you may use it for different um, functions. In. So it is a, also TensorFlow is an end to end open source platform for machine learning. It has a a comprehensive, flexible ecosystem of tools, libraries, and community resources that uh, lets researchers uh, push the state of the art in machine learning and the developers um, easily build and deploy machine learning or deep learning powered application. So if you talk about the architecture of TensorFlow, TensorFlow architecture works in three parts, basically. Pre-processing the data, uh, Build the model means first you have to pre-process the data for training and uh, testing, and then build the model and then definitely again train and estimate the model. So it is called TensorFlow because it takes input as a multiple dimensional array, also known as a tensors. So you can construct a sort of flow charts uh, of operations called a graph that uh, uh, you want to perform on that input, the even the uh, input uh, goes in 
it uh, one end and then uh, <coughs> it flows through uh, the system of uh, multiple operations and comes out um, the other end uh, as an output. So this is a why it is called the tensor flow because the tensor goes in, it flows through a list of operations and then it comes out the uh, other slides. So we will discuss uh, tensor flow in a detail in a coming lecture with uh, some functions particularly. And uh, dear students, thank you very much for uh, watching this uh, lecture. Uh, you will have to watch this lecture it is too time to understand what uh, we discussed today. Inshallah, next time uh, we will come with uh, another topic of the artificial intelligence. Take care of you, stay blessed, stay home in the time of COVID-19. Thank you very much.